Let's take a look here at example number seven and try to start to summarize all the different ideas that we've come up with so far within this section. Let's take a look at what we have here. We want to determine whether each of the given sequences below is going to converge or diverge. If it converges, I want to find the exact limit. And if it diverges, of course, I should be able to explain why it diverges. All right, well, let's take a look here at this first part in a sub n, with a sub n being negative one to the nth power. Well, quickly here, I'm going to go ahead and just observe that what I'm really dealing with here is a sequence that goes negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one, negative one, positive one for the rest of time. Notice that it would be very difficult to just directly compute a limit of this because even if I try to convert to a matching function, I'm going to get something like negative one to an infinite power. I'm not quite sure what to do with that. But I can see right here, right away, the following. I can see that the terms of the sequence oscillate between negative one and positive one. Well, this means that ultimately the sequence does not approach any value, right? I mean, like the numbers in that list aren't narrowing in on a particular value. They're just kind of ping-ponging back and forth between this negative one and positive one. Well, if that's the case, then I can say that then the limit of our a sub n as n goes off to infinity does not exist. And thus, a sub n is divergent. This one's almost really easy to spot, right? There's no way these numbers are moving towards anything. They just continue to alternate between these values. I have an easy argument here to confirm that this is indeed divergent. Now, what you'll notice here is that I didn't actually do the computation directly of like any sort of a limit. It was just easy to see what happened as I looked at some of the terms of the sequence. Now I can see down here, maybe on part B, that ah, looking at individual terms of the sequence might begin to get a little bit messy. In fact, I could probably start to guess right away, these aren't probably going to be oscillating between two different values. So maybe I can take a slightly different approach here. Let's see what I could come up with. Well, how about we go back to our standard go-to of making a matching function for our sequence. That's almost one of the first things we would always try. Let's see if this is helpful. Let's let f of x be equal to the square root of x plus 1 over 9x plus 1. Okay, well if we can find the limit of this, then we can certainly find the limit of b sub n. All right, so I'll state we calculate that the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity is the limit as x approaches infinity of our square root. And based on what we know about properties of limits dealing with continuous functions like a radical, you may recall that you can always take that limit and bypass a square root, provided that what we come up with for the limit underneath doesn't cause us to do something like square root of a negative. But I can get to this. This is a really valuable step to be able to get to, because now if I can just establish the limit of what I have on the inside here, I'm good to go. Ooh, at this point, I could easily go ahead and maybe use something like L'Hopital's rule. Notice my fraction here is of the form infinite over infinite. So I know this is going to turn into the square root of the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over 9. Of course, then that limit is just 1 ninth, and the square root of 1 ninth is just a third. So I can see here that the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity is equal to a third. And thus, the limit of b sub n as n approaches infinity 
is also equal to a third. Argument over. So I can see here that, again, not every problem requires the same approach, but I have to use all of the different tools that I have available, all those different boxed theorems and definitions and things like that, to my advantage when I come to a new problem. Now let's take a look down here at part C, last example for this video, and a rather tricky one. Let's see what we come up with. Well, hmm, uh, I could try to create a matching function and uh, maybe try to do a limit of it. But I'll notice right away I'm going to have this negative one to a power, which is kind of awkward. Because if I have all of my n's here replaced with x's, and then I try to do a limit with that negative one to a power, that, that's going to be difficult to determine. Oh, wait. But since this is alternating, right, I can see this negative one to a power makes this an alternating kind of a sequence. It's going to be positive things and negative things kind of flip-flopping back and forth. Maybe I can use that kind of like absolute value theorem where I look at, let's see what it actually stated, this. If I know that the limit of the absolute value turns into zero, then the limit will be equal to zero. Let's try to use that here and see what we can come up with. Okay, so how about we do ahead, or go ahead and do this. So I'll say, uh, how about we note that the absolute value of C sub n is the absolute value of our negative one to a power. Okay, and let's see here. If I want to make all of this positive or non-negative, notice I don't really have to change anything about the denominator, right? Because again, n's already a number that's going to start at one or larger. So I should be fine there. The numerator might be negative or positive, but in order to make guarantee that it's positive, I could just get rid of this negative one, the alternating piece, right? Just essentially get rid of all the negative ones. I get something that looks like this. Perfect. Well, now I can go ahead and try to calculate what the limit of this is. Although I might recognize that that's going to be a little bit tricky to do on its own. So maybe instead of writing we calculate, how about we start by just saying, let's move to a matching function now. This could be x over x plus square root x. Okay, now we can try to calculate the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x. That's a limit as x approaches infinity of x over x plus the square root of x. And that's a little bit messy, but again, L'Hopital's rule can come in and really save the day here. So take the derivative of my numerator. It's going to get me 1. Derivative of the denominator is going to be 1 plus, and let's say it's going to be 1 over 2 square root x. Well, now I can easily apply my limit here, right? I could do the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom separately. I know I'm just going to get 1 for this piece, and then I'm going to get 1 plus, and if x is going off to infinity, this portion over here is just 0. So overall here, the limit is 1. Okay, great. So the limit of f of x is 1. Thus, the limit of the absolute value of c sub n as n approaches infinity is 1. Okay, so what does that tell me about the regular c sub n? Be very careful. Go back to that theorem again. What does the theorem tell me happens if I calculate the limit of the absolute value and I get one back? What does it say? It says nothing. It doesn't tell me anything about what happens if I get a limit of one. It only tells me what happens if I get a limit of zero. So actually, this theorem is not going to be very useful on this question. Now, I show this here because this is going to be the typical sort of experience that you're going to have when working through questions, where you're going to try something and it may not work the first time. That's okay. Let me show you then how else I might be able to deal with this. Let's go ahead and actually look at what happens with terms when n is an odd number and terms when n is an even number. So I'll say we will look at the even and odd terms of the sequence. 
Let's take a look at what happens when I observe these. So notice that I am going to get with odd terms, right? If I have odd terms, that is when I plug in a 1 or a 3 or a 5, so on and so forth, I can see that my c sub n in those cases could be simplified down. Because notice if I plug in an odd number for n and then I add 1 in this exponent, I'm going to get negative 1 to an even power. Notice that's going to leave me with the following for a formula for c sub n. But of course, I could then say that the limit of c sub n in this case as n goes off to infinity is 1, just like we saw up above. However, when I look at even terms, my c sub n is going to produce a negative. Notice again, because I'm going to have an even plus 1 is an odd, negative 1 to an odd power is going to produce a negative. And then in this case, the limit as n approaches infinity of my c sub n would turn into negative 1. If I think about what this means pictorially, let's say that the odd terms are in blue and the even terms are in red. If I'm drawing out a picture of what happens here, I can see, oops, let me actually re-sketch that, but I can see that my blue terms, the odd ones, so like items number 1, 3, 5, 7, they're all going to be getting closer and closer and closer to a value of 1. Whereas the other terms of the sequence, the even numbered terms, like thing number 2, 4, 6, and 8, they're going to be moving towards negative 1. But of course then, this becomes pretty obvious to see that, well, where then do all of the numbers in the list go towards? Do all the numbers in the list head towards one single value? And the answer here is very clearly, no. So I can write the terms of c sub n do not approach a single value, right? Like they definitely do not approach a single value. And so the limit of c sub n does not exist. And if the limit of c sub n does not exist, that automatically means c sub n is divergent. So, wow, I can see here that I, I had to use a lot of different ideas kind of all at once to understand what's happening here. Now, I'm going to recommend that almost right now you go start taking a look at that 511 worksheet to start practicing some of the ideas that we've already covered. And that might be useful because in the next several videos, we're going to start to take a look at uh, some more theorems and examples, but trying to build up again kind of this toolbox of techniques that we'll have to try to tackle more and more questions. But if you go to the worksheet now and you practice just a couple problems, you can start to solidify some of the ideas that you're already seeing here.